Hello, everyone, and welcome to News Decoder's first Decoder Dialogue of the Year. My name is Maria Krasinski. I'm the Managing Director of News Decoder. We're a global news site and media education platform based in Paris, France, uh, with team members and school partners based all over the world, some of whom we'll meet today. Now, every week, News Decoder publishes exclusive news stories by a roster of professional correspondents and student journalists alike, which you can read at news, news-decoder.com. But we also use the tools and techniques of journalism as a way for young people to investigate and go beyond their comfort zone to learn about global issues from multiple perspectives. In our Decoder Dialogues, we convene diverse youth and expert voices around virtual roundtables like this to discuss and decode the big issues in the news. Um, before we get into today's discussion, just wanted to go over a few logistic notes. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared to News Decoder's website in the coming days. Um, we'll open with introductory remarks and discussion among our panelists, then open the floor to Q&A. This is an interactive event, meaning we encourage you to submit questions in, in the Q&A tab. You can also vote on which questions to ask our panelists. Um, please feel free to share comments in the chat box, um, but put your questions into the Q&A because that's where we'll read from. Um, so now on to today's event, let's talk mental health. Um, as we've seen in the news across the world, there's a mental health crisis worldwide, uh, with some calling it the next global pandemic. A 2022 report from the World Health Organization found that the COVID-19 pandemic triggered a 25% increase in the prevalence of anxiety and depression worldwide, hitting young people the hardest. The increase coincides with disruptions in access to quality mental health services, leaving gaps in care for those who need it the most. Now, the WHO called this a wake-up call for countries to pay more attention to mental health. Uh, and this is what we're here to discuss today. You know, what does this global, new global pandemic look like on the ground? Uh, before we get started, I'd like to ask my colleague, Marcy Burstener, News Decoder's Education News Director, um, to, to pull up a poll we have for our audience members in attendance. Get our technical. Thank you. Um, so hopefully everyone can see this. So when we're talking about taking care of your mental health, can you easily access mental health care where you live? Yes or no? We'll give everyone just, you know, quick. And more seconds to, to answer this question here. This, this is a question worldwide. Like, can you access mental health care where you live? Five more seconds. And okay. So we can, oh, hopefully we, I don't know. Sorry if we have technical difficulties, but our end, 86% um, said yes, 14% said no. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that. Marcy, can you see that? <laughs> I can see that. You can see that. Okay. Yes. Um, forgive us. We're still figuring out polls and Zoom technology two years into the pandemic. Um, so, so that's pretty good. That's that's one piece of good news is that 86% of the respondents felt that they could access mental health services near them. Which is which is great, and maybe goes against the grain of some of these reports. Which is why we're here to, con to convene diverse voices um, and hear these perspectives. So we want to hear directly from young people. Is this a worldwide crisis? What challenges are young people experiencing in different parts of the world, and what kind of solutions are they finding? Um, so now let's meet our panelists, and we're going to go around and have our students introduce themselves and their school uh, and where they're calling or dialing in from, where they live. And so Kingsley, I'm gonna start with you. Hello everyone. My name is Kingsley Oyed Kachi Iron Amubo. I am from Nigeria. I currently attend the African Leadership Academy in South Africa. Thank you, Kingsley. Rachel, I'll come to you next. Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm coming from the Hewitt School and it's based in New York City. All right. Welcome, Rachel. Darian, how about you? Hi, I'm Darian. I'm from Wilmington, Delaware, and I go to the Tattnall School. Welcome. And Ayeyi? Hello, everyone. My name is Ayeyi Bang, and I'm a student of SOS from Amina International College. 
and I'm from Accra, Ghana. Welcome. And Simon, coming to you. Hi, everybody. My name is Simon Rodriguez. Uh, I'm from Colombia, and I study in the private institution, Gimnasio Los Cabos. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let's see what happens. Welcome. Thank you, Simone. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. And we are also joined by a guest expert. Um, so I'd like to introduce Victor Juarez from Guatemala, who has worked across business, higher education, investment, entrepreneurship, migration, and the tourism sector in Central American region. Um, but now he's devoting his life to bridging the gap of mental health access among underserved populations with his social enterprise to Consejería. It's a web-based solution that allows anyone to chat in real time and confidentially with mental health professionals. Victor was a 2021 Halcyon Incubator Fellow, which helps social entrepreneurs transform audacious ideas into scalable and sustainable ventures, and a 2019 Fellow in the Central America Healthcare Initiative, which aims to support innovative healthcare management and delivery in Central America. He was also a 2016 Fellow in the US Department of State's Young Leaders of the Americas Initiative, and has a great passion for Guatemala and use in the region, and is committed to increasing the impact of Tu Consejería. So welcome, Victor. Thank you for joining us. Um, where you go? Uh, but we're going to hear from our student panelists first. Um, they've all prepared uh, a bit of research or reports on what is the, the state of mental health and youth, um, where they're coming from. Um, so we just want to start the conversation by asking, you know, how big of a concern is mental health among you and your peers? And can you share what you've learned about mental health um, in your community? So I think we, we said in order, so we'll go in the order, I suppose, where we introduced ourselves. So Kingsley, I'm going to come to you first. Okay. Hi, everyone. So I did prepare a bit of research for this presentation, and my research was based on mental health in Nigeria. Mental health in Nigeria is not really a, an issue that is talked about a lot. Um, in 2019, Al Jazeera posted this article where they described Nigeria as having a mental health crisis. Those were the explicit words that were being used by the, university, um, by the Al Jazeera news team. Um, and in around the same time, I think just two years later in 2021, a Nigerian professor, um, Yusuf Wada from Danfordville University in Sokoto, is, Sokoto is a place in Nigeria, he said that Nigerians need to begin to destigmatize de de the mental health service as it is this reason that its research and development is understated by the government. So what I'm trying to say is that in Nigeria, the, the government itself promotes the idea that having a mental health crisis or having problems with mental health is a bad thing with the way that they don't allocate a lot of money in the budget to help to um, trained professionals who are going to help people with mental health problems. They do not um, create spaces in media or in... Nigeria actually has one of the most celebrated um, television channels. It's called Nollywood. So just like you have Hollywood, it's called Nollywood. And I think it's, it's the biggest movie industry in Africa. So there are not spaces in Nollywood where people are actually talking about issues with mental health. On the other hand, I wouldn't only blame the Nigerian government. Many Nigerians, including myself and my family, um, grew up listening firsthand to the stigmatization of people with mental health issues. So it's only, it only makes sense that because we grew up listening to this, this is how we are going to view mental health issues unless we choose, like it's a choice you make, you choose to um, educate yourself and you choose to be just to destigmatize it. Um, Nigerians with depression never really realize their affliction until it may be too late. This has led Nigeria to have the 15th highest suicide rates in the world, actually, not just in Africa. Um, and in 2021, Nigeria was ranked one of the most stressful countries to live in on the planet, the second most stressful country to live in on the planet, actually. So um, in my research, I realized that had the Nigerian government engaged in the development of its mental health services through innovation and probably research, then Nigeria would, pro would um, 
prepare more experts in therapy and fields like social psychology that would help Nigerians to um, tackle their mental health issues. Because Nigeria has the Nigeria is the most populous country in, the, in Africa. So it doesn't make sense for the most populous country in Africa to have such little representation of mental health and to have such little um, facilities that are catering for a population of over 200, 200 million people. Additionally, citizens in Nigeria need to make the most of the services available to them by first destigmatizing mental health and prioritizing mental health services. And it's very interesting because I also ended with um, the, the, the kind of society that we live in right now is very individualistic centered. What I mean by this is that people only tend to think of themselves. They don't think about how their actions are going to affect the society that we live in. So if mental health is not something that is gaining anyone money or it's something that's going to um, make you like very famous or something, no one is ever going to think of it as being something that should be that should be necessary. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for sharing that, Kingsley. And I think you brought up some points there in your research about the stigma uh, around discussing mental health and what we see represented in the media and how that even impacts the care and having healthcare professionals available. If you don't think there's a need, right? And I'm sure that's something that we'll, we'll come back to in, in our discussion, but thank you for raising those points. Um, I'm actually gonna go to Darian next. Um, to, to share what, what she has found in doing some research and reporting into mental health in her community. Uh, so my mental health was on the Tattnall community as well as in my school as well. And I found that many of the upperclassmen as well as juniors and seniors and a little bit of sophomores um, have lack of sleep and have less number of hours while they're sleeping. And especially the seniors, they are very stressed out on college applications. So in the US, college is very prominent. And as me, I go to a very renowned in Delaware college preparatory school. So get, getting into college is most likely you're going to get into college. So and applications are very um, heavy, I should say. And kids and young adults struggle to differentiate from one another so they can get into college. So what I found out is juniors and seniors are very stressed out um, and the demographics in Delaware, especially private and public are very different. Um, public schools are more lenient well as in private schools, they really push for you going to college. Um, and how really I found out was kids handle the stress is they kind of just deal with it. Um, many try to um, organize their thoughts through reminders on the app, they use their phone, try to write down what they need to get done. Um, but I also found out they don't really have a lot of coping strategies to help. Um, and that also affects with their diet, sleep, activities, and so forth and so on. Um, I also found out the pandemic didn't really affect the kids at my school as well. Um, we found out that most of the kids here really kind of took on the pandemic as, hey, this is the time I need to really focus and help myself. So they really, the teachers were really helpful with the pandemic as well. And the teachers here are very ama are amazing and they really help with um, the mental health as well. So they know, especially the workload that we have, that we have and we're put on, especially it's towards the end of the term. Um, the teachers are really, they really know that we have a lot of work and they're really lenient and they understand and they're really compassionate on what we need to do and how we wanna be our best selves, especially for the future and for now. Excellent, thank you for sharing that perspective, Darian. And again, bringing another element into this, you know, the, the personal pressures that a lot of young people feel 
around college and the stress and how that can impact your sleeping and eating and your habits. Um, but you also brought up at the end there how important it is to have a supportive community around you if you have supportive teachers and friends. So thank you for that. I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to that as well. Um, so next, I'm trying to uh, give some variety to our countries represented here. So maybe Simone, how about we come to you next from Colombia to another continent? Yeah, first. So uh, basically, in Colombia, individuals try to hide like what mental health is, try to hide what they're feeling. And that's something uh, public institutions uh, tend to be uh, like poor in their like quality. I've have I, I have friends who who went to you know, like affordable or a uh, public uh, psychology institution and they were they felt judged they felt like uh, the things that they talk with their uh, psychology like uh, uh, major was was being shared with other people and that was something that created um, a feeling of uh, they, they felt very uncomfortable with it so in order to have good quality uh, like help you need to have a lot of money and the and what i'm going with all of this is that there are things that you can do in order to have a healthy mental health and there are things uh, you can do without uh, the help of of professionals and involving your habits, your routines. And that's something I want to talk about in this conference. Like uh, things as simple as drinking water, having good sleep, meditating. I want to talk about the concept of, of meditating because everybody thinks that meditating is like sitting in a corner and closing your eyes for one hour. But actually this is, uh, th this is not like this. Like everybody has a different process and everybody can meditate in a different way. The importance of this is like having time with yourself, having silent time, a time without distractions, because we live in a world that that is full of, of, of things all the time. You're on your phone, you're in social media, you're watching videos. Uh, if you think there are small amounts of there is uh, a small amount of time in your day in which you are not consuming things. So it's very important to just have time for yourself and, and being silent or doing an activity that makes you feel well. So yes, um, I'm willing to discuss these topics, also hearing your thoughts and context. So thank you again. And Thank you, Simone, for sharing your perspective and you brought something up there, which kind of ties into stigma about even when you're seeking healthcare, how you might feel judged or feel like you don't have adequate privacy, um, but also the importance of good habits and finding time and space to unplug and, and set away from the distractions. Um, Rachel, I'm going to come to you next. Um, so, you, know, you have a unique experience among our panelists and that you've actually published an article on News Decoder exploring the connection between mental health and sports. Um, and so I wonder if you could share, you know, what you've discovered about mental health in this context and give us some insight into what you learned in your reporting. Oh yeah, so I wrote an article about mental health in tennis, which was kind of built off of the whole Naomi Osaka scandal where if for those of you who might not know, she's a very well-renowned tennis player, the highest paid female athlete of all time, Forbes reported one year, super well-renowned, bunch of endorsements. And because of how good and successful and how quickly she rose to fame, obviously she got a lot of media attention. And so there's a point in one of the French Opens where she suffers from really bad anxiety and depression. So she felt it was really hard for her to always go to press conferences after, and especially when the comments were very really negative. So she kind of tried to refrain from press conferences for a little bit and not really go to them after the matches as much because it, she thinks it like affected the way she played, obviously, because I think so much performance ties into your mental health. So in cause of that, it struck a big controversy online towards kind of about what line does your job 
come first over mental health and at what line do you prioritize your own mental health? So when I chose to write an article about it, I knew I wanted to interview people. So luckily I was able to get an interview with Patrick McEnroe, which was a really great experience because he was someone who played on the tour, um, but in his time before social media, which ended up, we talked about being a very big contributor, but then also is now someone who's part of the entertainment aspect of tennis and sports. So he does build success off of interviews and talking about things, which exactly what Naomi doesn't really like. So when I talked to him, it was really interesting. We talked about how it's a very unique situation because when he grew up, he never really saw, hey, if there was something on a newspaper, you just not pick up the paper that day. But coming from Osaka, she was one of the most verbally attacked players on Twitter. She got around 30,000 hate comments one year alone. So for her, it's very different because she needs that whole fan base connection where it's very unique for her to be able to talk to her fans on her Twitter um, from her own words, have like a really personal connection. But at the same time, for her to get all the hate is a lot. So then I also was very intrigued to the psychology behind it and for someone kind of removed from the environment, what their plans were on it. So I talked to Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman, who's a psychiatrist at Columbia. And so from his take, he thinks it comes down to the end of the day that you have to understand there is business obligations, but also how can you be successful in your field if you're not mentally fully okay and you're not, it's very hard if you have to put in this space every day and if it's starting to take a toll, obviously, on your success. So I also thought about the aspect where I'm a junior tennis player as well and something where if I grow up and I were to directly go on professionally, it's something that I have to manage, which people haven't before. And so when I talked to Patrick, I think one of the biggest things I learned was kind of how important it has a support system around you. Because if you're going to deal with so much hate in the press and social media, all of that, which really causes uptick and anxiety, as we've seen in studies, you know, so different from what I'm talking about, just in general and teens and everything, social media is such a big correlation to mental health. But if you have to deal with that, I think to have a team around you that's supportive is such a big aspect in such a big way and being able to maintain it. Because at the end of the day, the problem is that the people who were in a dress situation, someone's going to have to lose money in a sense where if they're really to prioritize mental health and anxiety in terms of sports and entertainment, then they would lose a big chunk of all their press conferences. And at what line, I think I talked to Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman about this, like at what line do you end it? At what point is someone too anxious? Is someone not anxious enough? If someone's predisposed to anxiety, is them doing press conferences going to lead to them probably developing it more? So I think it's very much still up in the air. It's something that, you know, not even tennis people in general in sports are discussing. I think especially as social media and anxiety and all that has become less stigmatized, which is a great thing. It's become a much more prominent conversation in these fields. And so I think at the end of the day, it ends up becoming a choice between entertainment and then personal well-being and understanding that if you were to pursue one of those jobs, it's going to be something that you have to take on, which is incredibly hard. So I think that having a support system is so important, which I think even on a much smaller scale to someone every day, whatever field you go into, whatever age you are, whoever you're around, I think if you really have to struggle with social media and mental health, any of those things at the end of the day, like being able to step back, having such a support system around you was probably the biggest thing I took away from my time in the article, which is you know a great experience and everything I've talked to. I think that was the one point with everyone, any player, psychiatrist, anyone I talked to on any scale, that's the one thing I think that they could all agree with, which I think is important to keep in mind in this generation. Excellent. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, that's already come up, like the importance of having a supportive team around you. And I thought you raised an, an interesting point there, too, about having your business obligations or your school obligations and needing to step up to it. But also, how do you make sure that your mental health care is in a place where you're able to fulfill that and, and finding that balance, which I think we can all relate to, um, to working towards. And so Ayeyi, we'll come to you um, next to, to share your perspective um, on the mental health question in young people. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Again. Um, so in my community, um, in my school community, in my um, area around, and mental health is, actually, is a very big concern among my peers, even though, that, even though it's not talked about a lot, in Ghana, um, I feel like it's important to have a very good um, mental health and to, in order for you to be sound, to be safe, to be healthy and to be happy. And in Ghana, only about 1.4% of the healthcare budget actually goes to mental health and according to the public health of Colombia. So there's a very big stigma around um, mental health in Ghana. It's not so good. And um, I feel like one of the reasons that 
um, caretakers, like the people in charge, the community, the older, older generations feel like in order for you to succeed in life, you have to show it like a tough or a hard exterior so that like you can survive better. So talking about mental health, like kind of leaves you, they feel kind of leaves you and vulnerable and like you open up to, it's like open up, opening up to people and you being vulnerable is not in your eyes a very good thing because it leaves you um, for people to target your weaknesses and everything. So I feel like um, there's an internalized and fear of um, um, students and children being vulnerable and that's, that's what makes, that influences the stigma around um, mental health in Ghana. And in my school community, um, we have a lot, we have a support system, so we have counselors around who can go and see people in our school community, but around, and um, counselors are actually kind of very hard to find, and they're just a very, like, low percentage, percentage of people who actually see um, healthcare professionals to address mental health issues and to, like, help people to cope with things better. Yes, that's Hey, thank you, I again kind of bring, bringing up this question of stigma and and finding counselors um, and, and this idea of having a tough exterior and not being able to show vulnerability. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, so thank you to all of our student panelists for sharing those in, insightful comments, you know, to share the perspective where you are. Um, so now I'd like to turn to our guest expert, Victor Juarez. Um, thank you again for joining us. And, Victor, I'd like to start just hearing about what inspired you to found your social enterprise to Consejeria and, you know, how do the perspectives that our student panelists just shared compare with what you're experiencing in your work? Thank you, Maria, and thank you all of you for sharing all these insights. I think that really summarize one of the main reasons of why we started to try to give mental health access to youth like you, to like youth like all of you, really, because it's in, at least in this region, it's similar to what some of you said about accessibility of professionals, about the big stigma around not only mental health itself, but about asking for help in general. So all of these different Again, insight and, and what you were sharing is what we have been seeing in, in Guatemala, North and Central America, Mexico, and in the US, especially with the, with the Hispanic population. Um, there's a, a lot of cultural issues that allowed us, or maybe that kept us for asking for help. As Simon was saying, it's really something about us not being uh, used to ask for help or to say that we need support in a specific topic. So many of the, the activities or the services that we provide are extremely confidential. It's really based on, on youth like you being able to share what you're feeling and asking for help from professionals, uh, which already make a big difference. And so we have been working a lot of eliminating all these barriers of access. So it's, it's technology-based, it's, it's through a chat, we give first aid psychological support. And it's this confidentiality that has allowed us also to serve even between or in, in between being part of a youth audience, uh, a lot of women survivors of violence, a lot of youth with suicidal ideation, and many other problems with substances, and, and there's a lot of problems among the youth population in this area. And it has been really hard for them forever. I mean, it's, it's probably the first time that they have access to a professional through any of our channels, and it's already something that we have seen that starting to change their lives. So some of the things that you also mentioned is that there's, it's really having access to mental health is a privilege in many of, of our countries. It's something that it shouldn't be a privilege, it's a right, it's a human right to have access to this type of services, but it's, it's so interesting to see how from other perspectives, especially yours, that you, even at the beginning that you said that it's easily accessible to have access to mental health is easy in your countries. In mine and in this region is probably one of the hardest thing to access is mental health. Not only because there are not enough professionals, but all of these barriers that I, I was mentioning you at the beginning. So I think that 
it's 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 an amazing topic. Uh, I I congratulate you for for coming up and mention and talk about these topics around in your context in your community, and to see as to see it as a potential future for all of your support network and all of or you becoming a support network for other peers. I think is it's what makes this topic so so important. So that's what I can share, Maria. Thank you, thank you so much, Victor. Um, so I'm gonna move us now to our full gallery view here and move into the roundtable discussion among our panelists. And, and thank you again for all sharing these important and different but interconnected perspectives. Um, and so we're gonna have the opportunity for our panelists to kind of ask each other questions um, about what we've just heard, and then we'll open up the floor to Q&A from our audience. And just a reminder to put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A box, sorry, not the chat. Um, I see we've got one there, so don't be shy. Please put in your questions. Um, but I'm just gonna get started. You know, several of you brought up the idea of, of stigma and you know, having to put up a tough exterior. And just a general question, you know, do you think it's important to talk about mental health on a public stage like this? How do you think this helps the conversation? Any takers? Um, I think it's really important to talk about this and not really brush it under because I know many people who don't really understand the severity of mental health. And it, it's really, I guess now nowadays, it's really um, become more of a topic now. It's not really brushed under. So to talk about this on a global platform is amazing because, you know, it really gets the insight on whether or not mental health is really prominent in different countries and different areas around the world. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. Any other panelists want to chime in? Why is it? Yeah, I, I, I How about Kingsley and then I, or I, 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 let's go with you and then Kingsley. Thank you. I also feel like it's very important and very good to talk about mental health issues on a public stage like this because it really gives the youth, especially, um, a platform to actually voice out what is actually going on and it shapes the upcoming generations to be more open about mental health. And people, I think people, like, people don't understand how, like Darian said, the severity of mental health, because if you are very healthy mentally, it will, you have a very great life, I feel, because when you have mental health issues, you just feel so down and stressed and, Life is just very, is way harder when you are not sound. And I feel like speaking about mental health is very important. Thank you for sharing. Kingsley, you wanted to chime in. Yeah, yeah, I do. And I it would even give an example to something that Darian spoke about in her introduction speech. Um, she was talking about the way that um, students in her school were handling, um, I think the college application process. And honestly, that just leads me to remember something that literally last week, I was writing an essay in school and this essay was about the absence of love in our current structured schooling system and the, how there's no love in the way that we treat ourselves and in the way that we treat others, and also in the way that uh, the schooling system currently treats us. What I mean by what I was arguing in that essay is that when we go to school, uh, um, we are we're kind of like force fed this mindset that it all starts here. Everything here. So after this, you receive these grades that are like the best grades, and then after you receive the best grades, you go to the kind of like best university and then after that you go to the best job so there's always a best something that we're searching for and trying to achieve so if why i was talking about the absence of love like if we love each other it would we would have envisioned something very 
different from the current system that we have now. I think the system that we have now is pretty much designed to make us fight each other and always compete. It's not a very sustainable system. And even as long as we talk about mental health, as this system continues to be like that, it's not something that we can really escape from. More people continue to go to school and be inculcated into this idea of achieving always at the highest level, which isn't really a bad thing. It's just a bad thing in the, when the process of achieving at that level comes to play. When we think about what students go through to achieve at this highest level, it's when it now becomes a bad thing. Yeah, most definitely, um, which reminds me, I think something you know, Simone was talking about maybe in our earlier chat about how you're constantly comparing yourselves to others, other students, other countries even, and this competition that just fuels some of those, those feelings of, of anxiety and how can we change our systems or change our behaviors to, to better succeed in there. Um, Hey, Marcy, do we have any questions coming in from, from our audience? We do. We have three questions, actually, but let's start with one. The first question is, do you think having emotional imbalance means you can't handle yourself? Hmm. Rachel, yeah, let's come to you. Um, so in my opinion, I actually saw this question. I thought it was super interesting. I don't think it means you can't handle yourself at all. I think um, to some degree, it means that maybe it'll be, it's, you know, easier for you to fall into like a feeling of being, you know, more stressed or anxious or depressed or whatever it is, it's probably easier for you to fall into it. But I don't think it means you can't handle yourself at all. I think I know, obviously, it's hard and like, depending where you're from or in different places um, to get help and therapy and all that stuff. But I do definitely think, you know, it's more than possible to be able to handle yourself. And so I think maybe you're starting with like, you know, it's a little bit harder for you than the average person, but it's more than possible to get help. You know, it's all about learning to cope. And I think once you learn, you know, like healthy coping skills and how to like feel yourself falling into a bad feeling or things, you know, that'll kind of cause you not to feel your best. Once you're aware of it, I think you're going to be completely fine as long as you're more aware of your boundaries and how to help yourself. Well, that kind of leads to the next question, actually. So, Simone, did you want to chime in on that before we move to the next? Yeah, before the next question, I wanted to say that uh, having emotional imbalance is part of life. You know, it's part of the it's part of a process, and it doesn't matter if you have problems because all the, we all have problems. The most important thing in these cases is how you react to these problems. You know. If you scramble, if you, if you like, uh, if you face this this problematics with with a bad ad attitude, or if you if you don't have like the strength to face these things, uh, well, these problems, um, you you're just in in a process. You're just in a process, and a uh, part of it. Part of it is to think and to like process what it's going on, you know. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's all process. We're all working through. Hey, Marcy, sorry. Next, next question. Oh, well, there was a there was a question that led right into that, and that's as a young person, what type of coping skills would you recommend to another young person? Um. I think what really helps me is surrounding myself with people that are going through the same thing. Um, I tend to look at my peers and my peers, if my peers are going through, we kind of, you know, go through it together. So you're really not alone. Um, being alone is not, it's not good at all. So I really suggest like if you surround yourself with people that are going through the same thing, you guys really bond on that and you really try to pick each other up and help each other. Kingsley. Yeah, so even for introverts, because even me, I find it's hard sometimes to share my feelings with people. I think the best thing that has really helped me is like having a journal. I've had a journal since like 2015. I've had a journal for I have many, many, many journals. It always helps. It always 
interests me when I go to my previous journal and I see how I was thinking and how I felt at the moment and how I've like kind of grown past that. I think um, um, taking account of your feelings and like keeping them in something tangible that you can always go back to is a really, really good way of therapy. Definitely, seeing how far you've come. Aye, you had your hand up. Um, I actually did this uh, study with some of my friends from my school, and many of them gave um, some examples of how they could. Um, some people said that listening to music helps them actually like relax and take some time to you know get, get into a different space or a different world from what's around them. Some people like they pray, they resort to their faith, whatever they believe in. Some people do breathing exercises actually. There's there's many of breathing exercises online where if you feel stressed or if you feel panicked or anxious, you just take a minute to like breathe and calm down and calm your nerves. And I find that positive affirmations actually help. If you wake up in the morning and you tell yourself that. You're going to have a great day that's everything it's not going to last forever and just tell yourself good things it will really help and um, some people take breaks like if you feel that you're just getting very overwhelmed and um, i suggest that like, you just take a break take a break and go watch a movie just take a break from everything um yeah like that darian said she said i'm um, surrounding yourself to, with a good good friends, people who go through the same things as you. It's, it's also very good. Um, some people resort to do, doing sports, like working out, because when you work out, it actually releases a lot of like, um, yeah, good, good feelings, I feel. Um, going on walks, some people go on walks and going to just a serene, peaceful place that they feel will give them like a different, setting from what they are and also because social media is also also impacts i feel it impacts mental health taking breaks from social media also can help you cope better yeah. Thank you. Yeah, those are all great tips for for anyone really i'm not just saying people simon you had the, something to add uh, taking some things that were said previously I wanted to add that we are all like students uh, or people that it's working. So we all know what our routine is. We all live in a routine. We uh, all our day it's divided by these like lapses of time in which we have everything organized. And it's okay to have a routine. It's okay to to have a plan uh, in order to function. But sometimes uh, this routine consumes you. You know, sometimes this routine starts to feel like heavy or you start to feel uh, bad, but you don't know what's happening. It, and sometimes it's because you need you need to spend some time in, in yourself. You need to, to do different things in order to to have a diff to have different experiences because we're we that's in our in our genes, you know. We, we are made to live different experiences and and always uh, like spend time with yourself. You know, it doesn't matter how. That's definitely, that's definitely. Um, just a reminder to keep adding your questions to the chat. I see we've got a few more here, including a question for Victor, for Mr. Juarez. Um, Marcy, if you wanna read that one. Yes. the quote. The question for, for Victor is, um, in your experience, is there a particular group of young people or students who suffer mental health problems in higher proportion than others? Like from a particular socioeconomic group or from a particular area or for, from a particular nationality? Um, and thank you for the question. I, I read it before and I think that it wouldn't be fair to say that there's a specific group or a specific demographic that suffers most or less. I think that it's a matter of access and having the opportunity to share what you're feeling. So I don't think, I mean, I think that mental health is an issue that covers us all in all the world, any type of demographic. But it's this type of 
of freedom of, of this type of, of, or this opportunity, just an opportunity to, to be able to, to mention or, or sharing about how you're feeling, which comes to me, that question that Hippolyte is asking the, in the chat is, is this, a, is, is this fear of, of others talking about your problems, what really kept and has forever kept many youth to be able to share what they are feeling because they are afraid that somebody else will know and somebody else will somehow make fun of what you're feeling. And I think that is all about having access to a support system as you all were mentioning and, and be able to, to choose one or to choose a person or to choose a service that you know that is confidential enough that you trust and that you can then be able to, to share what you're feeling. We have seen a lot of, well, for example, as I was saying that maybe 70% of our users are women, young women, but I think it's all, it all has to do with the level of machismo that we have in our country and in our region. So for men, it's more difficult to be able to share how they are feeling. And I think that that, that opens up for another big conversation, but I think that uh, it's a problem that needs to be addressed for everyone in the same level. And for us to be able to give a service as a, a support for everyone in, independently on, on their demographics, so. Thank you for sharing that. If I, if I may jump in with sort of a quick question for, for Victor there is, you know, with um, conversations like this and with News Decoder in general, we, we like to talk about the challenges, but we also like to look for solutions. And uh, an organization like Tu Consejeria, you know, you are creating a solution. I'm wondering how you measure the impact. How do you know that you're having an impact on the, the youth that you work with? <laughs> That's one of those questions that's always kept us from sleeping. <laughs> it's really hard to measure and to be sure that it's our service or our support, what is making people feeling, we can say better in a way. Uh, but really what we measure in our theory of change on, or how we can share that we are creating a change or impacting lives is measuring the amount of users of people that are having access to a psychological support for the first time. Uh, this is almost 90% of our users. Uh, another metric that we use is the level of, of wellness or the level of, of support that they know that, or how they are feeling at the beginning, at, at the end of a session. And that's it really, because it's, it's really hard because maybe you, you use our service and you have access to a psychologist or to a professional at, and in the same day, uh, your partner gives you a great kiss or you won the lottery. And so there are so many other uh, uh, variables in your life that is really, really hard to make sure that it's because of our service that you are feeling in a, in a way or not. So those are the main two metrics that we use, but we have have users that have been with us for three years. Uh, so it's, it's something that, again, our target audience is people who have never access to these type of services before. So being able to say and to share that we have people from very rural areas, uh, women especially that have suffered violence for a long of time, having the opportunity to share and to ask for help is what really fills our heart every day. So, so it, it's, it's difficult to measure this, but I think that being able to say that we are serving this population, a very young population, is giving us hope for the future. So yes, that will be my answer. Great. Thank you. Marcy, do we have any other questions? Well, for there's us? a question for Rachel. Um, and the, the person thanks, thanks you for sharing your results and views. What are your thoughts on the role celebrities um, sports related or in general can have in normalizing this conversation on mental health, especially on social media? Um, so I think it's a really good question. I think that I think that celebrities or people of certain status um, in whatever field opening up the conversation is kind of essential to this problem getting, you know, the attention it deserves and really helping it. Because I think that I think, you know, for the people at the top who are in charge of these companies or kind of like to my point, I guess, like the in, like entertainment industry where it's stressful or any one, it's obviously an uncomfortable conversation for them. And, you know, for things have to change, it's like people aren't going to necessarily want to address it because it's, you know, it takes effort to change and to it really does. And it's, you know, a big step for anyone involved in the situation. But I think that for celebrities to step in for anyone at that level to really normalize conversation, it kind of forces it to be addressed. 
Um, and I think that also a lot of people really do look up to celebrities and people who are really well known. So I think that in that regard, you know, people who are even at smaller levels, you know, even for someone at school who has really bad anxiety and, you know, let's say teachers aren't necessarily being the most like accepting or there's not like the best strategies and they want to speak up. I think that that can really inspire them. Um, so I do think it's really important. I think it also makes it kind of, you know, like I think we've seen in many different things throughout especially the past year or two on social media when people really get involved and there's really, you know, like a lot of talk about certain cause we have started to see a lot of change, which is one reason I do somewhat like social media for that extent. So I think that for them to get involved and reach the amount of people that they can is very important. I think it'll create a lot of um, good things to talk about. I think also people at that level really, you know, have the money and necessarily like the means and connections to really make a difference. So I think if they really step in, there's a lot of change that we could see. And I think it would be so beneficial to the younger generations because it's like social media isn't going to go away realistically it's really never going to maybe it'll change it's not going to ever go away so I think if we make it into a platform where people talk about things and use it you know beneficially to the most extent that they can I think that there'll still be a lot of change. Sure and Kingsley brought up Nollywood earlier in his opening remarks and how mental health just isn't really discussed there among celebrities or in in the entertainment industry. Um, I wonder if with Aie or Simone in, in Ghana or Colombia, you know, what is the role of celebrities or entertainment in talking about mental health, if any? Is it something brought up in entertainment? Or maybe not. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So you mean how um, how celebrities influence like I'm mental just, health in general? Yeah discussed in the entertainment capacity, um, you know, are there media stars, celebrities, um, entertainment stars who are talking about mental health issues or not at all? No, actually, I, I, I don't think there are, but, but uh, like in the topic of celebrities, um, it's important to, to like to see a problematic, to, like a main problematic that is that everybody compares themselves with 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 famous people because uh, here in Colombia famous people always like has this image of the perfect person that has everything that that lives uh, the best life uh, in that lives also in the best house and these are things that shouldn't be that way because that's not real that's not what that's not something that everybody that no one lives like that life. So it's important to realize that what you're see, watching in, in television or in social media, it's not real. And you may like fuck you, focus in your life and in your problems in order to solve them with a more like real like context, like uh, with a more accessible and more personal yeah way and that's it great thank you um you no know, we've been asking the the audience for all their questions i don't know if any of our panelists have questions they wanted to to ask of anyone else on the panel give this opportunity as we're nearing the end of our our talk here Well, Kingsley and then Simone. So I'd like to ask, we've talked a lot about um, reducing the stigma surrounding mental health. So what do we all think can be effective ways that we can actually reduce stigma? Um, I know like something other than um, representation in media. I think representation in media has been done a lot and the stigma still exists so is there any other way except representation in media rachel want to chime in oh you're, you're still on mute <laughs> oh sorry hi so um this actually kind of goes along with i think her name is jemima in the chat the question she talked about and i think A lot of times, I think in media, we talk about, you know, like mental health is very important. Everyone has mental health issues or not everyone, sorry, but like a lot of people. And it's something that a lot of people have to struggle with. Everyone has problems. But 
I think one thing to get rid of the stigma is like I think we never really talk about um enough about how like people get help necessarily and I think that a lot of times we'll hear about people online like or even celebrities like going through things and having you know hardships but I don't think we ever really talk about like how they've become better once they've seeked help and stuff and I think that part of the conversation is that you know we need to focus more on I think therapy is very beneficial for many extents kind of to the answer her question I think that you know like there's so many issues you didn't even realize were correlated to things that happen in your life and I think once you go to therapy it's like not only does it help yourself I think it helps people who you love because you're never you the way you act towards people is you know a lot to do with who you are too even if you're not aware of it so but I think to some degree I think to get rid of the stigma I think talking about success stories and how things have really helped you and that you know like you're not stuck with even if you might have anxiety chemically and you're stuck with it whatever you really can become where it doesn't affect your life at all and I think we don't hear about enough how it really can be treated. Thank you. So kind of hearing after care, you know, how has it helped people and open them up and change their relationships is one way to combat the stigma. Victor, do you have any any thoughts on that? You know, as you know, someone who's helping provide care and you know, how that changes the stigma around seeking care or just talking about these issues in general. It's a long road to travel around stigma. I think we have done a lot of activities around psychoeducational, around stigma, and it's always going to be the biggest challenge for a service for like ours for mental health in general. But as I was trying to type some replies to the to the other questions, creating safe spaces is is really important for any audience, youth or elders, which are another very isolated group in many areas. Uh, that requires us, well to feel not judged as some of you were saying at the beginning and and this is something that helps on creating the trust not only in a professional but in the whole approach of of trying to to find mental health support i think is we are all humans and and the trust process is extremely important in in mental health uh, in general you need to trust the person that you're talking to you need to trust your your context and you need to trust yours your support system in order to, for you to be able to share how you're you feeling. And this is something that of course is not easy, but I think that that eventually will, will help us all to, to navigate all of, of the many things that we have to struggle with in our lives. So. You're muted, Maria. Now I'm on mute, darn. <laughs> Uh, we always get caught in that. Um, so I just wanted to come back to Simone because he had a, a question for the group as well. And then we might be nearing the end of our time. Yeah, thank you, Maria. So my question for all the panelists is how foreign content in terms of social media affects uh, the people of your country or the people around you? How social media and social media made in other countries affects your context. We take that one. So the influence of social media from other countries outside of your community. How does that impact you? Kingsley. And then I. I think it's 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 very interesting to raise because um a lot of people, at least a lot of my friends and I, we use TikTok and Instagram. They are like the most popular social media platforms um, in my school. And um, a lot of things that, because um, TikTok is, at least the TikTok is heavily populated by um, and So a lot of the things that we do, our teachers, interpret them as is Western culture. So um, even in, even if um, someone brings a problem that is surrounding a mental health issue, it's always under the context that this is something that you have learned from. It's always under the context that this is something that you have learned from TikTok or something that you've seen these Americans doing. And Except when it's, it's so funny because it's always when it's meant to, like, how do I say this? America, the idea that 
um, we only learn bad things from America is always used by them to justify a lot of things, the behaviors that um, the teachers at my school, the, the teachers at my school behave. Yeah, so I think a lot of um, foreign media really influences in negative way, really influences how um, we continue to relate to mental health here. Great, thank you. And then I hear you just quickly because we are just about out of time. Okay. Um, I really tell that's so what Kingsley was saying because um, in Ghana too, um, like, among the youth, we also use heavily TikTok and Instagram and everything, and we actually encounter a lot of American Western cultures on TikTok, and I feel like it influences a lot of our content and what we think about, and like um, we get into this bubble where we echo what we actually get from the like social media, which is heavily Western culture, so it influences what we, how we think, I feel. And even though um, it's kind of weird to say that a certain group of people think a certain way and another certain group of people think a certain way, it's actually kind of true because um, I feel like in different places, you learn different, you're taught different, your brought up different. So social media, having like everything from different people influences other cultures and brings in ideas from other cultures into um, different cultures and kind of a chain mm -hmm. effect. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I think we can have an entire follow-up webinar discussion on social media and its positives and negatives and, and impacts worldwide. Um, but we are out of time, or actually a little bit over time. Um, so we'd like to close this discussion with another quick poll, which I'll ask Marcy to, to throw up for, for our audience to, to vote on. Um, if we get our part in our technological Hello. novices here. Um, but we would like to thank all of our panelists for joining and sharing your insights to Ayeyi, Darian, Kingsley, Rachel, and Simone, um, and our guest, Victor. Thank you so much. And we'll close with this question. Should there be more public conversations about mental health? Um, thus far, the unanimous yes, which I <laughs> couldn't agree with more. It's an easy question, softball question. Um, so indeed, you know, hopefully there were so many issues we could have spent the whole time talking about here, um, but thank you all for your questions, for sharing, um, and thanks to you all in the audience for joining us, and um, as we said, we'll be posting this recording on news-decoder.com soon if you'd like to share it with anyone who couldn't be here today, um, and please do um, follow us, speaking of social media, and subscribe to our news story so you can stay in the loop from when we have our next Decoder Dialogue. So thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>